Well, greetings everybody. I um, hope you've had a good lunch and everything else. If you if you weren't in a highly active conversation that was uh, in a private Q&A with the devs. Um, I'm Mal Burns and this is uh, the regular kind of, uh, view. well, we used to call it a viewer panel. I tend to put, uh, think of it as an interfacing panel. Um, you know, rather than specific viewers, but um, a whole load of stuff has actually come up today already, which um, we, we're almost segueing uh, into um, as far as uh, viewers are concerned. Um, one thing that I think, um, you know, I follow what people want from devs and viewers and stuff like that. And um, then, you know, we're looking at uh, OpenSync code, which is a server code, basically, but you can't obviously live without the viewer. And so, uh, you know, the, there's so much interoperability between the server and the viewer. You can't really view them as separate things. They're all part of the experience. And uh, there's been a lot of moves recently um, talking about other ways things like viewers could be implemented. I mean, could there be an interpreter, for example, that puts um, OpenSync regions into um, a WebGL kind of viewer on the web, for example? They're actually connected in a genuine way to the whole hypergrid. Um, there are other things going on where, um, you know, they, they are separate platforms, but they offer you a web interface as well as a, a fully fledged uh, viewer. And we were just talking about uh, Crystal Lopez's on viewer, for example, which uh, is based on the OpenSync Singularity viewer, but it removes a server side anything a grid operator doesn't want you to have. So, you know, you can sit and walk and listen to music, but they may prevent you doing anything else. And um, for certain people who want it fast and easy, um, you know, that is an ideal to, way to get in. And obviously, if something like that, the fast and easy was on the web too, it would be even better. Um, so there are a lot of uh, a lot of things going on, and also I'm going to mention up front because um, I, I, I would hope maybe our guests will uh, address this when they're talking. <laughs> is that um, I follow the news at uh, Second Life, or rather Linden Labs, and um, they they ha they were actually at an Amazon conference uh, uh, last couple of weeks, I think, uh, talking about moving Second Life into the Amazon cloud. And this obviously isn't going to happen overnight. Uh, too many servers involved, I imagine. But um, apparently, this is going to mean some incompatibility with what Linden's called the third-party viewers. And uh, various third-party viewers are a bit concerned, you know, because although Second Life is their main market, and um, but are a couple of them, you know, um, OpenSim is really just a, a, an extra audience on top of their main uh, customer base. Anyway, um, so some thoughts there. But the first thing I'm actually going to do is actually introduce you to everybody who's, um, as it were, on the panel here. Um, and uh, we'll do them in turn if I actually open up my <laughs> the proper notes. I'm going to start with uh, I'm going to start with uh, Robert Adams, who's um, also sort of known as uh, Mr. Blue on occasions. Um, Robert's been an open simulator core developer for near a decade. is responsible for the bullets in physics engine. Uh, the addition of VAR regions, many thanks for that, Adam, <laughs> and uh, many a bug fix, bug fix and performance in, improvement. And um, uh, you can find this whole bio um, on the website, but uh, we won't have a panel if I read all these in full. Um, so welcome, Robert. Hello, am I supposed to talk now? No, I'll just check you there. I'll just check you there. I'll go. I'll go through the rest first. Okay. Right. Um, we also we're also joined by Adam Frisbee. Um, now, um, Adam is uh, CEO of Sinewave Entertainment, who um, actually uh, he's thus is um, CEO of um, Sign Space, uh, which is uh, a new mesh-based virtual world. Um, it, it happens to be also in Unity, and it's. Um, like some other things, it's a kind of um, wall garden in a sense, though it is open to, um, you know, open to making connections. Let's put it that way, but we'll move on to that. But um, Adam was also one of the founders of um, OpenSim here. So really, he is a sort of former core developer, <laughs> right back to the core, so to speak. Uh, so he can bring a perspective on that to the conversation too. So welcome, Adam. Good Thank you. you. 
Right. Uh, next here, we have Dieter Hain. Um, Dieter hails from Munich in Germany, or oh, this is where he was born <laughs> and raised. Uh, he made uh, first contact with computers programming in 1981, which set him on a course for a master's degree in uh, computer science uh, in Munich. And, uh, he describes himself as a frequent metaverse uh, traveler. Um, so we will uh, come to this uh, shortly. Um, I will add into this, it's not on my synopsis, oddly, oddly enough, but um, Dieter is also responsible for yet another um, uh, kind of independent platform uh, known as Cyber Lounge. And uh, Cyber Lounge is, um, if you can imagine OpenSIM on the web, that is Cyber Lounge. Um, on, uh, you can export OER files, for example, or content and put it up on Cyber Lounge. The only difference is that Cyber Lounge is not an OpenSIM viewer. It is simply a web platform that um, you can put OpenSIM content into. But when you post it, you're basically, you know, say it's an art gallery. You can have it on the web via Cyber Lounge, but you can have it um, in worlds. Um, on the uh, hypergrid as normal. And, um, I will mention here that um, uh, Selby, uh, uh, um, Selby Evans, I think of Melba, who is on the panel later, I believe, um, also um, uh, is promoting a thing called Web Worlds, which basically is, <laughs> I think you agree, Dieter, um, Cyber Lounge under a slightly different name. So uh, welcome, Dieter. Okay, thank you for having me here. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Now, a familiar face to all of you. Uh, she didn't make the uh, call panel this morning, but she's been chatting away in a, Q a private Q&A over lunch. Um, it's um, Krista Lopez, sometimes known as Diva Canto. She's a professor with the Department of Informatics uh, at the uh, Donald Brennan School of Information and Computer Sciences at the University of California, Irvine, and a core open system developer. And, of course, she developed the Hypergrid, which is a federation architecture and protocol for uh, open simulator virtual worlds to interoperate, basically. And so, uh, welcome, Krista. Thank you. And finally, except she's not here, um, it seems, but we, uh, she may just be late, so if another um, face appears on the panel here, it will be Cinder Roxley, who um, is a software developer in 3D and high-performance computing, and, but uh, she maintains both the Alchemy Viewer, that many of you may be familiar with, but more importantly, has recently taken over the uh, Radagast Viewer since the uh, sad passing of its um, creator. Uh, and Radagast is more of a sort of text-based um, client, which I actually find very useful. It's a way of being logged into everything but the visual world, and you can sort your inventory and answer your friends' questions from there. Uh, anyway, whether Cinder makes it or not, uh, we don't know, but we have plenty to talk about in the meantime. Um, now, um, I have another panel coming up in a couple of hours, actually, which is um, all about the hypergrid, um, incidentally, uh, which I believe is pretty much the killer app of OpenSIM. And I know from um, our conversations a few minutes ago uh, that you would, uh, um, uh, I think probably everybody would agree with me, but certainly uh, Krista does. Um, I'd like to start, um, we haven't got Cinder here, so we don't have anybody here fully representing um, a, a, a fully fledged um, of, uh, OpenSIM viewer per se today although i'd like to start with you krista because uh, as well as uh, creating a hypergrid you developed the onlook viewer which is a variation on the singularity viewer but in particular um it it is well it's not only a customizable experience but in some ways it's very lightweight experience because um if if people are forced to use the onlook viewer to go to an event um um a grid which say might otherwise be closed will let them in and server side it actually implements controls that limit what the viewer can do so um i might go to a talk for example and i can take a seat i can walk into the venue i can take a seat i can listen to media and see things being res but using onlook i won't be able to do anything else i, I don't get hijacked you know by the build tools or the fancy things i don't understand so this seems to be an ideal viewer for the light you know um if somebody you need a lightweight viewer for somebody this this would seem to be it um 
maybe just briefly uh, tell us about on law but um also if i can ask you are, are you developing anything more on that side of things at the moment uh so uh, let me um tell you about on look on look was a, was and is an experiment and uh the experiment was very clear i wanted to find out i wanted to poke at the second life code base the the viewer that so it took singularity and uh i wanted to find out how difficult would it be to kind of redo all the part of the viewer that does the the user interface that's not the the 3d part but all, everything is 2d so the menus the, the traditional graphical user interface the menus the pop-ups the buttons all of that stuff that we see here on this viewer i want to find out how difficult or how easy was it to to make it uh customizable and in particular so the first phase would be to to kind of hide certain you know certain options that might not be needed all the time that was the first phase but the second phase would be to actually program the, what options were available so you know if you're in a if you're in a, a situation like this a conference you might see a gui that has to do with the conference event. So you have things, uh, buttons for the schedule, you have buttons for for uh, things that are related to what is going on. And, and so this is programmable uh, UI. Um, and uh, that was an interesting experiment. Uh, we were able to kind of knock out a few things like uh, the, the buttons that are shown on the, on the bottom bar and the menus that are shown on the top bar and uh and so so it was not uh totally hard to hide things it would be a lot harder to 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 add new things um and th oh. that would be it showed it, it shown to be really you, we would have to rewrite a lot of the viewer to be able to actually show new things in a programmable manner. Uh, so we had sort of a plan at some point to how to do it, which should consist of some heavy re-engineering of the viewer to sort of wrap it in a JavaScript engine mm. with which you would then uh, um, program the, all the, the 2D parts, menus and stuff like that. Uh, but you know, and that I think that technically the plan is uh, is feasible, it's viable. It's just it's a lot of work, and uh, and that's the part that uh, you know, me being mostly an explorer and a poker, I really don't have the time to do that kind of heavy lifting of 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 doing that kind of development. So um, it's sort of on hold until somebody wants to um, you know take it on, uh, find some 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 incentives to actually develop it but mm. yeah that's the story of unlook well i think i i, I think a good segue here um i will come to no i'll come to Dita and then come back to adam um because it's a, it's a flow to this um Dita, um cyber lounge for example and um obviously the the thing selby's doing with you uh web worlds um you effectively have created, haven't you, an OpenSIM viewer. Uh, the only thing is it's not connecting to the OpenSIM grid network or the hypergrid. It is simply a web-based viewer that can display effectively uh, things that are built in OpenSIM. Have I got that right? Almost, yes. Um, or, almost, it's, of course. <laughs> it's, not, it's Maybe it's only an 80 or 90% uh, OpenSIM viewer because it supports... Uh, uh, avatars which are cr uh, created like uh, OpenSim avatars, you can uh, import uh, any con or almost any content as long as it's static for now uh, into uh, the web world. Uh, most of the imports are now already done by drag and drop, so it means you can have your inventory not inside the world but on your uh, desktop, and sure. you can simply drag the uh, the content of your inventory into the 3D view. Right, but. As you said, uh, it's not connected to uh, an open SIM grid. Uh, I've created the backend on my own, and it's uh, not so far compatible uh, with open SIM. It's a real uh, web stack uh, which manages everything. 
And now, I, I for example, um, uh, we will be hearing from him shortly too. Actually, uh, Fred Fredericks uh, has this uh, open sim installer. It's like the old sim on a stick. I said it's not a stick on my local machine. It's uh, called Outworlds, and um, you know, I do all my hybrid gridding from there simply because, um, as you say, you know, everything is in my own hard disk, you know, um, if all the grids I'm members of go down and go away, it won't bother me because I just launched myself onto the hypergrid direct from my own computer. Um, and, you know, um, I, I can see that when you've got, um, when you've um, uh, got a, um, say an installation, I've got 20, you know, it's a VAR region, 25, so it's not really compatible, but just say I had a small region built that way, uh, what is nice is that I can literally export that whole region and put it up in Cyber Lounge, and um, it wouldn't be connected. And when people went to it, it wouldn't be going to my region on OpenSIM, but it would be going to a duplicate. And you could argue if this is something like an art gallery or what Linden Lab, uh, sounds like I now call it experiences, not destination, it's just an experience I have, you know. <laughs> you know. Um, I could have that in two places. So I could be able to, I could post a link in um, Facebook and tell people, come and see my art gallery. Here's the link on the web, but if you're on the hypergrid, here's the hypergrid address. And I could give them those two options. And basically what they would see is the same thing. And possibly one day, um, you know, the build itself could possibly have back end scripts in it, which would allow it to connect um, to connect the two installs. In other words, they're on separate platforms, but there might be things running in the build, like an interactive whiteboard that can connect the two worlds together. Um, you know, so, um, you know, that, that in theory would be possible, wouldn't it? Uh, the way you're working with Cyber Lounge. Exactly. Oh. This is or this already is uh, working. So uh, we did some tests uh, with virtual whiteboards, and the funny thing was we were three people. One was in Second Life or in OpenSim. Uh, I was in Cyber Lounge, and one was directly in the web browser, and we could work on the same whiteboard at the same time from two different places. <laughs> Wonderful. Right. Now I'm going to move to Adam. Adam is uh, very familiar with OpenSim. <laughs> He's one of the core <laughs> founders and the original core team. So um, uh, that's a given. Um, but um, I'd also like you to answer this from the point of view of Science Space because um, Science Space, again, is um, a very different world. Uh, it's built in Unity, uh, principally Mesh, but uh, one of your builders, we know him very well, but there's uh, uh, Joey Obama here, or Sun Tzu. He's actually on a session tomorrow, uh, probably talking about uh, bridge, what he's done with bridging worlds, but very much the same thing as applies. Uh, um, you know, I'm thinking of that art gallery uh, that will be on a region on my desktop connected to the hypergrid using OpenSIM. Um, I've got the same gallery, a copy of it in something like Cyber Lounge. And I could also have a same copy of that same gallery, which I could export as a mesh and then via, via Unity, and I say via Unity only in my case, I could then upload it into ScienceBase. And that would not only put it into a different platform as a, a kind of duplicate, but because ScienceBase has both a web interface and a viewing client, it's yet another way of putting it on the web. So, um, Adam, really, it tells a little bit about ScienceBase, but uh, any thoughts you have in developing this kind of interoperability side of things? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, to give everyone, if you haven't heard of ScienceBase, I think uh, we, we came on and sort of talked about it for the first time really last year here. Um, basically, long story short, I got very tired of um, being bound to the Second Life viewer when, when I was working on OpenSim. That was the reason we built Science Space, was because there was just so much um, legacy architectural decisions that have been made um, when we actually were, were working with OpenSim that it just frankly made more sense to, uh, to build a new world from scratch than try and sort of re-engineer the entire stack from underneath itself. Um, now, in terms of interoperability, I think that I've, I've talked about this before, but I think the key thing about is just giving you as many options as possible to view the same content. So content actually built in OpenSim can be brought into ScienceBase. Um, I see Austin Tate in the crowd here. 
Um, he has actually done quite a bit of work on getting OAR imports working straight into um, Science Base, which is really cool. Um, I've yeah. seen quite a bit of that. Um, but you know, I mean, in terms of interoperability, I mean, the ultimate thing we want to get in with with our viewer decisions is actually just accessibility, uh, and that's pretty much the the principal driving force beyond all other other driving forces that we have, and we do have plenty, like taking limits away from creators so you can really build what you want. But uh, I mean, one of the things we've been working really hard on has been getting a good, high-quality WebGL client, and it is much harder than it sounds. Um, frankly, the browsers, all of them have got horrible, horrible defects in their JavaScript engines, their WebGL renderers. I mean, you name it, it's probably broken on Safari. You name it, it's probably broken on you know, Internet Explorer. Um, it, it's really sort of a, a long challenge. But once you actually get it right, once it actually works, it's fantastic because you can literally can just go to a URL and hop into the same region that people are accessing with the sort of the full-featured graphically rich clients as well. Mm. Okay, uh, I'll just issue a quick apology. I've seen a note from Bill Blyce and um, I, I don't know if a single girl is here too in the audience. Um, WebWorlds, um, with that name and spelling is developed by single gold mode independently. Um, uh, that's the one I mentioned earlier. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dieter. I, don't, I thought it was a version of Cyber Lounge, but go figure. I've got that wrong. So my apologies for that. Um, yeah, I mean, one, one, one intriguing thing I have thought about in terms of interoperability um, is the idea that, well, I mentioned this art gallery, for example, uh, imaginary, of course. Um, it could be anything, TV studio, whatever. There might come a point where I can collaborate with people in OpenSim and build something that is basically exported to um, a platform that runs on the web, um, maybe Science Space, maybe Cyber Lounge. And not only is it a duplicate, of um you know and only a duplicate of of the open sim build but the build itself could within it have certain scripting and things like that that maybe worked from a web back end somewhere that so they will work in a similar way in all worlds i mean not all platforms um interpret scripts the same way and things so it's not that easy but the notion that we could start using open sim as a prototyping platform where we can freely build very intuitively and prepare stuff for deployment um, on other platforms. That's one of the reasons I love the idea of my OpenSIM regions running offline on my desktop. You know, it's sort of a private space, do it, build it, and then see if I can get it to work anywhere else. Um, as you know, Adam, not very successfully, but I'm not a builder. <laughs> but, um, you know, the idea, uh, the idea that we can, um, you know, do things that way, do you think there is a, a, a future, and I know this isn't a viewer-specific question, but do you think there is a future for using OpenSIM, you know, um, you need tools as a prototype development platform for what ultimately may be deployment on other platforms. I will open that up. Um, actually, I'm going to open that up to Robert, actually, because um, I haven't got him in yet. So any thoughts on that idea, Robert? Well, I, I do think that the um, um, there's so many different use cases now for the for the viewer, quote unquote, um, yeah. you know, we, we talk about it being on mobile and on desktop and there's now all the VR stuff. Um, uh, I also think it's related to the AR stuff. I mean, you just yeah. take the world around it and you have stuff in, 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 a, in a place in front of the camera. Um, and uh, I'd really, I, I've been thinking about that, an architecture for a viewer should really separate the actual rendering or the viewing part from the virtual world back end yeah. um, because um, most of the most of the piles of stuff are built together as one uh, one big glob that is your viewer is an app or a, a, a web thing that you run. Uh, and it not only has the stuff to figure out how to put, you know, put what to put on the screen at the moment, but it also has all the logic to uh, interpret what the virtual world um, is sending it. Um, and um, I mean, I would like to have a viewer where a um, a sign space avatar could stand next to a Second Life avatar. Um, and yeah. um, so, I mean, 
uh, following up some of the things that Adam said, in, in some sense, uh, the 3D rendering in the browser is all broken, but in another sense, it's completely solved, quote unquote, with, with WebAssembly coming out this year and uh, their um, sign space is using the Unity plugin, uh, Firestore, uh, uh, Amazon has one, uh, Unreal Engine has a browser version of it, and that's only going to get better over the next year or two. Um, you don't have to be stuck with the the, the WebGL, yeah. whatever form it it comes in. Uh, so I, I think the base rendering technology is, uh, for some definition of solved, solved. Um, but then you all get back to, well, how do you, what are you connecting to to get the things that you're seeing? And then um, how do you interact because, or how do you create the content that you see? Um, and I think content creation, a lot of people are going outside, uh, outside tools where you have to do Blender or whatever and put it in. Um, I'm fond of in-world building, like in Second Life or Minecraft. Um, and um, I think that that those are kind of yeah. requirements for a viewer to be able to create a lively community where people build and people play. This is kind of what I said at the start, where it's, it's impossible to divorce the uh, server from the viewer, although, you know, they're sort of two, te two halves of the same coin, you know, and they can't, they can't, one can't exist without the other. Um, I, I'll kind of come back to Adam very quickly here, because um, uh, one thing he didn't mention, and uh, um, although he, he has done in science space, is that, um, you know, we were mentioning earlier that, you know, um, every software, including OpenSIM Viewer, because quite frankly, are, are learning software. You just want to be able to offer easy options as well as more complex ones. But um, Adam, Adam um, at the mo will tell us that at the moment, you know, you have to go into Unity, and that is a learning curve, and sort of understand the principles of, you know, making your objects and stuff, and working with them in real time isn't quite as intuitive as walking around them in live space. But there are certain building tools that Adam has put into the viewer. Um, uh, I uh, probably They probably don't work very well in the web viewer, but they do work in the um, uh, Science Space Client. Um, which, um, Adam, you, you described these, if I recall, as a micro set of Unity's own tools. The idea yep. being that somebody can enter your world in the science space field, just like they do OpenSIM or Second Life, and you will be able to offer them building tools, but the nature of these building tools will be such that they're sort of learning a micro set of Unity tools at the same time that will then, get, then give them maybe a logical jump into the full authoring software. Yep, that's exactly what we've been working on. So I, I see it as sort of a, a big, long chain. And I, this is something I've talked about before, and this is sort of the um, the democratization of creation. Right now that there is sort of two approaches in our viewer. You've got the in-world build tools, and they're somewhat simplistic, but they do exist, and they do actually work in the web viewer. Um, I still would recommend using the full, full viewer, but you can, in yeah. theory, do them in the web viewer just fine. Um, and then on the other hand of the spectrum, we've got the sort of the, the thermonuclear warhead of, of uh, content creation, which is Unity. And by that, I mean, it's just so many tools, so much power, but you've got to spend a bit of time learning those tools. Mm -hmm. um, and what I, I see is that there's this sort of a chain between the two. And what we want to do is we want to actually build every link in the chain. So we've got, at some point, you do have to cross over and fire up Unity, but that's sort of the midway point, ideally. And what we've got is the in-world build tools. We use all the same keyboard shortcuts, the same... Um, control gizmos, all that same stuff as Unity itself. And then on the other end of the spectrum with Unity, we've got the full thing. And every time we add sort of one link between those two, we sort of begin making a, a, a guided path from one to the other. So you can start out with the simple tools. And then as you start using and getting used to the keyboard shortcuts and things, because again, we copy all the same keyboard shortcuts Unity does. So it's all identical keyboard shortcuts for controlling the camera and everything else. Um, as you learn all those tools, you do pick up Unity knowledge. And then when you actually get into Unity, you're like, oh, hey, I already know this. This is fantastic. Yeah. Um, because the, the reason why we, we've got to do that is because there's a fundamental gap between users who create and users who don't create that doesn't need to be as hard as it is right now. Um, uh, yes, there will be users who never want to create a thing, and there's probably quite a lot of them. Um, I would say you look at the statistics, it's probably something like two-thirds of the population. Um, but there's sort of this one-third who do actually or could be prodded into creating content if they they had the right tools in front of them 
sure. the reality is that right now in virtual worlds, and I'm going to include Second Life, Open Sim, and all the other ones, content creation is really locked to no more than five percent of the population. Um, Open Sim yeah. is probably a bit higher just by the nature of the fact that people who created content are drawn to it. Um, but if you look at the sort of the global populations, uh, it's a very small small percentage, and it could be easier. It could be higher. Um, the easier you make content, the better it goes. I view proved this mm. with um, things like being able to remix other people's content. Um, the number of people who remix other people's content versus create original content is like three or four times higher. Uh, and again, sort of every step that makes this easier is another yeah. batch of new creators you can bring on board. Well, exactly. I mean, I, I will freely admit I'm a remixer. <laughs> I'm a graphic designer. It's component parts that count, not, not being able to do anything. Um, interesting, because um, my focus here, I've mentioned it so far, is uh, things like AI Austin's in the audience here, the, the, the OAR uh, converter, for example. It makes it easy to save an OAR file uh, offline then uh, run it through the converter and then suddenly everything in that OAR file is in a folder full of DAE, DAE, DAE files, which mesh. And you can drag them all together into, say, Unity and everything maintains its position. It's a way of just bringing the whole thing across. Or you can extract the various DAE, DAE components that you might want. Now, what interests me is your bottom line with size space is virtual goods, really, I think, in the long run, getting a lot of users, yep. obviously. But, you know, the bottom line for the company is, is going to be the virtual goods. So that that's the area of the commerce panel later. But on the community side and the interoperability side, what is the possibility? And, you know, other people can comment on this, too, if they feel like it. What is the possibility of a reverse of that direction? Could I, for example use the in-world building tools in science space, which are a subset of Unity, and then build something really exotic, if I was up to it, in mesh in, in science space, and then export that exotic phenomenon back here as a duplicate into OpenSim. I mean, OpenSim supports mesh. There were variations, of course, but... You know, uh, do you think that will be a possibility too, where the, the the different platforms are different, but they will allow this back and forth? Yeah. So, so the naive answer is yes, uh, and the, the reason I say that's the naive answer is that I mean, we use standard formats. We don't go off and invent our own mesh formats. I mean, we we mostly use FBX, which is the one that sort of the entire industry has settled on these days. Um, yeah. But I mean, you can use. DA and all the other formats as well. It would be possible to write a um, an exporter via scripts. There would be some various elements that we'd need to sort of kick out because we've got things like content protection worries and things for our, our merchants. We try to be quite sure. quite strict on that. Um, but on the other hand, I think that the, the problem is that while you'll bring out across a lot of, say, the mesh, we give you a whole bunch of other tools. Like one of the things that we, we really focused on was taking all the limits away so you can write custom shaders, for example, for your content. Now, uh, for those who don't know, shaders are small programs that run on the GPU and they describe how something should be rendered. So if you want to do something like a hologram, a solid object, a shader is what, what defines the two. And I'll just bring that as, a, as one example. That would be sort of the kind of content you couldn't bring back just because it's simply not there. You, The moment you bring it back, all these limits lock straight back into place. And when you do that, I mean, yes, you can bring it back, but uh, the question is, would you want to? Um, would you want to take your content and sort of rip all the cool stuff out of it? Or would you like to sort of bring it somewhere where there is all this power? Because all that power needs to be added to the Second Life viewer in order to be able to bring that back and make it look good. Uh, and this was this was pretty much the inspiration for why we, we ended up building our own platform, because that stuff just was so insanely difficult to do that it was easier to build something new from scratch. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of people are asking where they can get the oil converter. Uh, you will find out that um, AI Austin is giving a presentation all about that later in the conference. So we'll make sure you've got the links to download that. Is so just search for AI converter on on the Googleizer. Right. Um, let me. Um, I, I was actually cautioned, um, although I've been told differently since, that uh, when um, Cinder, who I'm afraid just doesn't seem to have made it, um, you know, um, she said, I'll talk about alchemy and singularity, but don't ask me about Moses. <laughs> I'm under an NDA. Um, I don't know how much I can ask, but I, of course, the Moses project is no longer. I don't know. I know, Robert, you were involved, weren't you, with Moses to some extent? To some, uh, to some extent, to some I was extent. working with them. 
and I gather that um, uh, there were prototypes made there um, in terms of an actual web viewer for uh, OpenSIM as it exists now. Is there anything you can tell us about that that is not NDA, or, or do you, uh, even if it's an abstract light, do you think there is any future in what they were working on? Well, I mean, they were working on a, a an architecture, which is, I think, an architecture you mentioned earlier of having a converter in between the viewer and the client, or in the, between the simulator and the viewer um, that did uh, asset conversions, yeah. uh, converted them to... Um, different formats, did mesh simplification, could do mesh uh, joining, um, and that sort of stuff. Um, and they had a very um, uh, kind of a uh, initial proof of concept that they used to get some initial numbers. Uh, but it was nowhere near a releasable technology yet. Right. So lo like everything else, it was at the <laughs> permanent beta stage. <laughs> I, I, I actually laugh when, you know, people are actually saying things like, you know, well, you know, compared to all these flashy worlds, you know, open some laws data and everything else. But, you know, um, as we're saying, you know, just the, um, the uh, there is so much, you know, when you actually take on these tasks that, will always look a bit dated or whatever because they're individual strands of a, a greater a greater picture. Now, um, this, is, this is a real nightmare, but um, I, I was actually uh, fascinated that the core devs, when they were speaking earlier, almost provided a segue to this panel because uh, the issue of viewers came up and it was quite clear that the, um, the core devs were saying, we know something needs to be done about this darn viewer. Um, and I, I think more so than ever. Um, firstly, um, something that's fast and easy to use, uh, and you know, um, where there's maybe a longer learning curve for people who really want to get into it, but not for people who just want to use it quickly, be it on the web, standalone viewer, or whatever. But there are uh, two things coming into this. I, I gather now that um, Linden Labs are moving Second Life to Amazon's cloud um, over a period of time. And, um, apparently some of the functionality of the, th what Linden calls third party viewers, and I guess that can be from Firestorm down to the others may be impacted by, you know, the way it will be served in the cloud, for example, um, you know, it'd be a bit more like, um, kindly, I gather where, you know, um, second life regions will actually be offline until the first person logs into them. You know, that continuous world that you can walk and fly about won't necessarily be there anymore. Um, I think that, it's, you know, it will depend on the speed with which they can bring the servers up as people request them. Um, I, I, I don't know enough about the mechanics to know quite know how that affects viewers, but I gather, um, I gather, viewers will have to change. Um, harking back to the core devs um, talking earlier, both, both at the Q&A and the panel earlier, um, they, they are clearly realizing a dedicated viewer is needed. And this is probably, be, you know, if we suddenly find that the, what we call the Linden third party viewers are becoming um, dysfunctional, well, it might be odd. They might work here and no longer work on Linden World, or they might work in Linden World but no longer work here. So the, the imperative for um, a viewer that uh, I, I personally would just love to see something I call a metaverse view, which actually would somehow interpret all the all the platforms and adjust itself. But I don't think that's going to happen very soon. But um, what, and I, I want all of you to answer this here, what, what are, is the likelihood and the drawbacks um, to kind of a universal viewer? I almost know Krista's answer because... Uh, I think I'll let you start this, Krista, but I think you're going to say, well, there's nothing wrong with the picture. You know, it is all the code that makes the interface on top of the picture kind of thing. Um, but it's the cost of developing that. I mean, um, you, you told me, it would, well, I'm not going to go into numbers and things like here, but the cost, you know, it would take somebody a year, you know, with a rather big budget to engineer that a, a rebuild like that, wouldn't it, Krista? Yeah, so viewers are, you know, viewers are, there's many kinds of program, programs and programming. Doing server-side programming is, uh, you know, it has its hardships, but um, but doing 
graphic heavy graphic graphics programming is a whole other parade and uh, yeah. because because uh, of, because of many many reasons for you know we, if you're doing front-end programs that run on pe people's computers you're going to have to deal with people having all sorts of computers from high end to low end high memory low memory many processors uh, a few processors there's also so much variability on the front end of things uh, and uh, and we know lots of different kinds of graphics cards and so th it's very hard to do a uh, graphics program like like the ones that we are seeing here that is uh, for, that performs well and 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 then these many circumstances so it's it's a quite a bit of engineering and uh, uh, a lot of it is not rocket science but it's it's just work and 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 that kind of uh, that kind of effort I think is. Um, it's going to be very hard to do it in the way that we had been doing OpenSIM. Um, I, I have a feeling, as I said before, that we need to have some incentives of and probably financial incentives for people to actually want to do that that kind of work. And uh, and so I, I don't know where to find that, but uh, it would yeah. be a nice thing if people would get together and try to do it. A combination of, of, of crowdfunding and, and maybe companies who are interested in, in developing. Yeah, it, this uh, when it comes to the core code and stuff like that, this is the problem about, uh, you know, it's not the problem, it's a great thing that if it's a volunteer and it's all open source and everything else and, you know, doesn't really have that, you know, hypothetical roadmap we were talking about earlier. But... Um, you know, it does mean that if if there is a major jump to be taken that requires funding, you know, um, one gets the impression that devs will want to work on with the code, you know, and it probably needs somebody to come in and how, they, they they really need a reason to build that ultimate viewer, if you see what I mean. Um, and um, I noticed Kay McClellan, and there's quite a bit of conversation going on in World, but, um, um, you know, are, are the um, viewer creators, we haven't got Cinders here, of course, but um, are open to addressing the needs of open sim. And uh, it's, a, it's a difficult one to answer. I, I will cite Firestorm because um, uh, uh, talking to Jessica quite a bit, I mean, she loves the idea of open sim and loves that Firestorm is used in open sim a lot. But, you know, she is, she has a huge dev team of about 80 people or something uh, just on the viewer side. And they are all second lifers, you know, and um, she can't get them in interested in writing the stuff for open sim. And, you know, she she wants to people to visit, you know, she's there's Firestorm user groups in quite a few grids on open sim. And she wants feedback from those people to say what they want and what they need, you know, and it's, it's another avenue that doesn't seem to be explored, you know, so join the Firestorm users group and tell them what you want to make it work better in OpenSim, not just generally, but in OpenSim. So I think they are, I think they are open, Cinder especially, although she's not here, you know, um, the Radagas client works very well for OpenSim and um, as does, of course, um, Alchemy. Um, Right, um, back on to that question, though, the prospects for a greater viewer, both the economics of it and the practicalities of it. Um, back to you, Robert, on that one, I think, before I move to Dieter again. This is probably where we have to start wrapping, so. Yeah, what, what, what was the question again? Um, just your thoughts, really, on, I, I think we all agree there will be a need for an open sim dedicated viewer, if not a metaverse open open viewer. Um, well, it's, so you, it's going to see it. Well, I keep I keep I keep buying my lottery tickets, and I haven't uh, won yet. Uh, so, um, uh, but given that, I think um, it's going to take someone to lo uh, lead the charge on the open uh, source uh, version of it. Uh, you know, to make a roadmap and start making it happen and see if people can be collected around it to uh, do the development um, and, uh, you know, make some decisions on which technologies to use. Um, and I think there's a, a lot of possibility there. Okay. Um, same question to you, Dieter, really. Um, you know, obviously, um, 
there's the aspect of a, a web viewer that would be compatible with everything, but also a standalone viewers. I mean, do, do you think um, there are any signs of this being a possibility or is it, do you think the cost is just something that it's going to take a flu for somebody to come with, up with for open sim? Yeah, also I think technically it should be possible, uh, but it really it it, it would uh, mean it, uh, to take a lot of effort and a commitment of uh, several groups so far. Um, I think with a web viewer, it's, uh, the prospect is even better because we started uh, from scratch very uh, very recently. So uh, what I have done so far, and uh, also what Singer Girl is doing with her web worlds, uh, is just a brand new kind of viewer. And mm. the thing is, uh, here we should have contact with the uh, core developers because what we will need is uh, to have a kind of uh, interfacing black box as a part of the server to sure. be able to use uh, web protocols easily uh, to, to get data uh, from an open sim server. Do you think, um, I think only Robert or Krista would know the answer to that, but... Uh, do you think there is anything in the code base of OpenSim itself that could be addressed to make it um, an easier process for, um, uh, say, um, a web-based viewer to be able to access the data? Um, um, probably... Actually, there are um, there are several possibilities. I mean, there's just start a core module from bases. Uh, there are modules like um, the dispatcher that was built a few years ago that actually has um, both uh, RPC type uh, access and uh, as well as security integrated with the OpenSIM security system um, for accessing stuff uh, inside the web for getting at the objects and that sort of stuff. Um, it wouldn't be too hard to put a, a module, um, have a module for OpenSIM that did that, it created a new protocol. Uh, in fact, it's been done for other uh, um, systems a long time ago, yeah. um, uh, but it, um, but a module, you know, how does that work with all the other things? I mean, the hypergridding, the, one of the problems with it is that all the regions aren't running the latest version, and oh, so yeah. if it required a module, that would be, you know, this problem, which is also why other people started working on outside uh, boxes that uh, essentially proxied the region. Sure. Yeah, I know that, that fit, you know, <laughs> it seems that every second time I hyper jump, I get a, this region's using a different version of a different server and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, okay, well, I, I'm getting my prompt for my, my backstage crew, as it were. So you've got two minutes left. <laughs> Stop blabbering. Um, time just flies. There's never enough time for all these. Um, uh, there, I, I'm going to give a plug for um, a show that I broadcast at noon on Sundays called the In World Review. Um, you know, it's a mixed show. It's an open-ended talk show. Sometimes it goes on for two or three hours. But the, these are kind of things we do uh, kind of address there now and again. Um, so the conversation continues. <laughs> also at the conference here, of course, um, we have a hypergrid panel coming up in a couple of hours, which I'm hosting too. Uh, tomorrow, um, Thursday Ember will be talking more about the um, the advantages of uh, the hypergrid, the killer app I mentioned. And um, indeed, AI Austin will be talking about uh, uh, the, the conversion stuff, the AR converter. And um, yeah, tomorrow, there's a panel called Bridging Worlds, which Le Lobo will be hosting, which will go further into the idea of creating uh, cross platforms, for example, the OAR converter and uh, taking things from OpenSIM and putting them on web, um, on um, Cyber Lounge and things like that. So, uh, uh, you know, um, it's all connected. It's all connected. So there's lots more to learn while you're still here. But for me and this panel, I'm afraid it's time to wrap. We've got more stuff coming up for you. So I'd like to thank everybody here. I'd like to thank Dieter Hain. Thank you, Dieter. Thank you. And it was great. And I think we should have really a, a continuous talk about these topics because I think especially a web viewer where you simply click a link in the, on a web page and enter the virtual world is really fascinating. Yeah, it's just kind of blam, you're there. Quick and easy, and it doesn't lag. Right. <laughs> um, and thank you to Crystal Lopez, of course. Uh, she'll be with me on the Hypergrid panel too because it's her baby. So uh, thank for now, at least. Thank you, Krista. Thank you. And uh, thank you to Adam 
from um, Science Space and one of our wonderful founders of OpenSim. Uh, not to forget that. So thank you, Adam. Thank you for having me. Okay. And thank you to Robert Adams, uh, sometimes known as Mr. Blue. I finally clicked on that one. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for having us. Okay, wonderful. So, um, as I said, it's a wrap. Um, I'm going to, um, I presume as a moderator, go take over from me and tell you what is coming next. But actually, in case they aren't, I'm simply going to, um, I'm going to open our own schedule to tell you what's coming next if we can. Um, typical me. I've got the right page open, have I? Um, yeah, where are we now? Um, yes, indeed. Uh we're going to hear from uh, from Fred, Fred Beckhausen, about uh, Dreamworld. Actually, and, uh, oh. we'll be hearing uh, the Mind Palace for English in Immersive Worlds. So oh, yes. Fred sorry. is after your other panel. You're already ahead uh, of yourself. Yeah, so. I'm going to get ahead of myself. What's new there? Embarrassment, embarrassment all around. Yes, indeed. So we have Lou Lobo, uh, Letitia, Sherwin Colgan, and oh, and Heike is on the next panel. So Mind Palace for English in Immersive Worlds at 1 p.m., which is eight minutes from now. So I guess you'll be getting some music on stream to keep you going in the meantime. And uh, thank you for having us, and good wishes for the rest of the conference. Mm -hmm.